A wise man once warned, don't steal, the government hates competition. And really, that's what we see in the status quo, where um, the American government is defrauding 80,000 Indian workers on our soil, while the Indian government is doing the same to 30,000 Americans on their soil. This situation and this injustice compels us to affirm a totalization agreement through an affirmative ballot. Today I'm going to be responding to each of the arguments brought up by the native speakers, starting off under the definitions of change in policy, their topicality arguments. Now, first they define changes to become different, and secondly they define policy as a course of action. Now, we will be addressing these together, showing you how we are changing policy. I have two responses. My first response, let's examine our current course of action. The current course of action is to doubly tax workers, so they have dual tax liability in the area of social security contributions. That's our current course of action in U.S. policy. So, the, uh, so to remove that double tax liability, that would be a change in our course of action. We would eliminate that current policy. Now, my second response is that negotiation isn't a policy. Now, the U.S. and India have been in negotiations but, uh, on a totalization agreement for three years. But the fact is that negotiations isn't a policy. What we've established is a policy. In May 2008, former UN, a U.S. ambassador to the U.N., John Bolton, in the Wall Street, quoted in the Wall Street Journal, says that negotiation is not a policy. It's a technique, one whose outcome is a function of many minute details, like goals and preconditions. So negotiations in and of themselves aren't a policy. Now, let's examine those negotiations. We've seen that, this is my third response, actually, I've had three responses, sorry about that. My third response is that the, the barrier to current negotiations. Now, we've been negotiating for three years, but something has held us back. Now, when I was on the phone with the lead negotiator for the, the Indian uh, totalization agreement last week, he directed me to an article in the Confederation of Indian Industry, published in June 2008, and it explains the barrier to a totalization agreement, what's keeping these, these negotiations back. According to the Confederation of Indian Industry, they say that the two countries last met to share their perspectives. The fact that the Indian nationals don't get any benefit owing to the long minimum qualifying period promised under the U.S. Social Security system is a serious problem. They need to contribute for 10 years to be eligible for these benefits. The Indian side is in conflict with the maximum duration that's allowed under the non-immigrant visas which most of these workers are on. For example, six years for an H-1B, five years for an L-1B, and seven years for an L-1A. The U.S. side doesn't see these contributions as money which the individual gets back lest the individual completes 10 years of residency. This is the main point of contention of, for these negotiations. So what this evidence is saying is that in the current negotiations, the U.S. is insisting on this 10-year permanent residency requirement for immigrants who come in and want to collect on, or, or who are contributing to Social Security. They say you have to put in for 10 years before you're able to get out. Now that in and of itself isn't a bad thing, but when we take into account the fact that the Indians who are working here can only stay for five to seven years based on their visas, we can see that they're contributing to the social security system with, one, not being eligible for benefits, and two, not planning to retire here at all in the first place. So we have to question the wisdom of a policy that taxes immigrants on a, on a system that they're not even planning to benefit from in the first place. That's why we need totalization, and that's the barrier to negotiations in the status quo. So all this shows that we are clearly changing or making a difference in the course of action currently adopted, our current policy toward India. So now that I've addressed these, I'd like to address two other things. They said that we're not changing policy but that ch because uh, totalization isn't a change in policy, but then right after that, they said that change is coming because we're going to to adopt a totalization policy. This is a contradiction on the part of the negative team that they need to clear up. Let's move down to their next point. They said that it won't benefit domestic workers, and this was under our definition of totalization. Now, this is, first of all, it's a misunderstanding of the definition. It is talking about over workers overseas, but it's saying, but, that, but that's the whole point. Our workers overseas, the 30,000 of them, those are American workers overseas. The whole point of totalization is to eliminate double taxation, double contributions for workers between two countries. So they're misunderstanding our definition. The second response is that it is helping workers in the U.S., the ones that aren't working in India, because first of all, we help the, the businesses that send the workers there by removing the double tax liability. And secondly, we also help our economy by, by improving businesses. So it's going to help Americans as a whole as well. So now that we've seen all this, let's look at their next argument. They talk about justice. They ask the question, what is justice? Well, the affirmative team sees it as justice as fairness, equity before the law. In our current law discriminates against foreign workers and, instead, and, and allows them to be defrauded out of their social security contributions. This is a violation of justice, according to the affirmative team. 
Now let's move down to their next argument. They said that individuals agree to the status quo by coming here anyways. Now I have three responses. My first response is that often employers send their employees overseas if, and if the employee wants to keep his job, he needs to go. So it's not always that the worker is going there willingly because a lot of foreign uh, companies with foreign operations send their workers there as, as, as if they want to keep their job, they have to go. The second response is that just because they come here doesn't give us the right to exploit them. Just because immigrants come here doesn't mean we can steal their social security contributions and say, ha ha, you're not eligible, go home. That's not <laughs> it. The second response, uh, I'm sorry, my third response is that they are complaining about these double taxation. Because uh, if, if we look back at our Solvency Point 2, India wants totalization. That's the reason why we started negotiations in the first place. So they are complaining they, they does, we don't have the right to exploit, and a lot of times workers don't come here voluntarily. Now let's move down to their arguments under our first term. Their first argument was that many H-1Bs don't pay Social Security taxes, and their second one was that Indians benefit. I have, I'm going to be tying these two together with two responses. First, neither piece of evidence was about Social Security taxes. This was about taxes in general. Secondly, it wasn't specific to India at all. And actually, I do have another third response. Sorry about that. Again, I have a third response, and my third response is that the H-1Bs are actually losing their Social Security contributions. According to Reddit India Abroad in November 2006, for hundreds of thousands of Indian H-1B workers in the U.S., the mandatory payment of Social Security tax has been an issue since workers who go back to India after six years of temporary employment in the U.S. cannot claim the money they have paid for their earnings. So they're paying into the system without being eligible for benefits. $1.5 billion being paid in by at least 80,000 workers. This estimate puts it at even higher at hundreds of thousands of workers. So we can see that it is a serious problem. They are paying Social Security taxes, and they're not getting the benefits. Finally, their third response to our first term was that they said it wouldn't, they wouldn't be eligible for benefits right away, but not ever. The point is that they're not eligible for benefits unless they stay for 10 years, which they're unable to do because of their visas. Let's move down to the harm to, responses to harm to. First, they said that there are no significant numbers. Well, we presented the number of 30,000, and we have to ask the question, how significant would be significant enough for the negative team if 30,000 isn't significant? It's clearly a signif uh, an issue that affects a significant amount of American workers and Indian workers when we take that into account as well. The second response is that it contradicts our definition. I've already covered that. It's a mis they misunderstood our definition. It is talking about workers overseas. And finally, the response to our harm three was that the economic loss was talking about India and Singapore, not the U.S. and India. But in our evidence, it specifically says it's resulting in um, evidence specifically says it's resulting in an economic loss to the large revenue loss to the United States and revenue and reducing competitiveness of business. So this economic loss is occurring in the United States. The barrier is there. Injustice is occurring, and that's why we need totalization. Thank you.